It's been a long time dream of mine to have a micro hydro system that supplements power to my house. And I'm happy to say that that dream has finally become a reality. I'm Seth with the Land to House YouTube channel, and this is my journey into micro hydro. The journey started in the early parts of 2020. I went up the mountain and got some basic calculations. My flow rate here is around 30 gallons a minute most of the year. The distance from my source down to where I wanted the turbine was 1,100 feet. The head pressure from the source down to the turbine is 150 feet, which gives me roughly 65 PSI. I was doing all these calculations and making videos on them when I was contacted by Langston's Alternative Power. Spencer Langston said he would like to work with me on this project, and uh, it has been incredibly beneficial for my micro hydro journey. So I'll talk to you more about that later on. I wanted to show you the steps of my journey to get to where I am today. My early setup was um, not very pretty and not very functional. And what I have now, two years later, seems to be working quite well. And then I also want to talk to you about some changes I want to make in the future. So let's step over here to the intake and I'll talk to you about that. My source water is a creek that comes off the mountain. It's spring fed and it falls down into my wooden box that I've made. And there is an inner tube behind this box that prevents water from escaping behind here. So it all makes its way into the box. And this is kind of the first catchment. It also collects a good bit of sand and silt and sediment, which I clean out from time to time. And uh, this kind of helps protect my uh, intake box here from all that extra debris. So my intake box currently has a piece of roofing rubber, which, uh, just flaps down here and lets the water slowly go over this edge. This box is called a Kawanda screen and it basically is shaped to pull water in and sloth off most of the debris that gets to it. So if I were to take a handful of leaves and place this over here, they uh, wash off instead of going down into the box. So of course you need a little bit more water than I have right now to really wash that off. But that's the concept at least, how it uh, is supposed to be self-cleaning. And I've found that it does a pretty good job. So you can see that right now I have a little over 30 gallons a minute coming down the creek. And this Kawanda box is sucking all of that in quite nicely. The Kawanda screen has a two inch output, but I already had this inch and a quarter piping and so I made this little manifold. It goes from two inch and then has these unisil grommets. And those uh, allow these three inch and a quarter pipes to come out. And that is uh, able to carry more water than this single two inch right here. So it does really well to take this water down the hill. This intake box has been through a couple of iterations in my testing phase. The first one, I tried to make a wooden box that mounted onto the rock surface, and I then used window screen. And uh, the problem was a big rock, probably about that size right there, came tumbling down the creek and smashed a hole through the screen. So I fixed it, and then I came back later, and uh, a stick had rolled down and punctured that as well. So. Uh, the creek definitely has a lot of debris that falls down in flood times. And so um, Spencer Langston started working with Elgin. And uh, Elgin is a company that makes giant Kawanda screens for large scale micro hydro. But they started making these small ones. And so um, he gave me one for testing. Now they're not cheap. This little guy right here, I think is pushing $700, um, which is, in my mind, it's rather expensive. But I will say, it's one of those things that you install once and it's there, you forget about it. So uh, it is worth having, even though it's um, a little bit costly. Um, so the old design, it lasted for several months um, before it just kept uh, tearing apart. Um, and the new design has worked flawlessly all year long. On that first design, the three pipes came right out the front and there wasn't enough area for the water to rest in. And so I had a lot of spillover and loss. So having this manifold off to the side seems to uh, suck more water down. In 
In order to get these three poly pipes to flow water downhill, I had to have them at a gradual slope. And so I used this little bridge. It's just some simple uh, one by fours. And uh, basically I zip tied the pipes to that and it just has a gradual slope down to the next stage of my microhydro system. And uh, this has worked just fine now for two years. I don't really see any reason to change it unless it uh, just falls apart. But for now, it's doing the job it's supposed to do. The next stage in the micro hydro system is this 55 gallon drum. This thing does two different tasks. The first one is that it builds and catches sediment down here in the bottom portion of the barrel. And that prevents those bits of sand and debris from being shot down the pin stock and hitting my turbine blades. Um, the Pelton wheel is made out of uh, a hard plastic and I don't want that to be damaged with uh, sand particles hitting it. The other thing this does is it gives this much space for variation in my water flow and also uh, reducing the air bubbles that get down to the pinstock. So as water goes into the source, it's dumped into here and the air bubbles can float back up real quickly before being sucked down the pipe. And you can see over here, it has an overflow and that just goes back to the creek. So I have enough water right now. I could probably turn on a second water jet down at the bottom and get more power. You can see I have the three different poly pipes coming into different locations here on the barrel. Besides an overflow pipe, I also have a clean out pipe down here at the bottom. And this clean out pipe allows me to drain the silt and sediment that gets in here over time. The 55 gallon barrel has worked flawlessly over the past two years. I definitely recommend that this be done in your own system if you're looking to install microhydro. Having the silt down at the bottom and getting the air bubbles out of the top will help save your turbine in the long run. Now the one thing that has not lasted is the way that I had the outlet to the pinstock set up. Because the 55 gallon drum has the outlet right here in the middle of the drum, I had to build a little stand to hold up the pin stock and position that so that it would not uh, torque that hole in the barrel. Well, in the winter time, this pin stock got cold and shrank and it pulled out my pipe here from the uh, barrel. So I had to come back up and get that put back in. And uh, when it shrank, it just destroyed my previous little stand that I had built. And uh, so I've had to rebuild this. The new one seems to be working just fine and it's holding up this pin stock nicely. I also had to rework some of this piping because of the way it uh, froze and busted and, and got stuck. So uh, having this section of pipe right here will allow me to disconnect it in the winter time so that if shrinking does occur, it won't pull this out. I'll just be able to have this move back and forth because I don't run this system in the winter. The pin stock is 1100 feet of two inch poly pipe. I purchased this in 100 foot rolls, so it would be a bit more manageable than getting bigger rolls. And I started unwinding this in the cold months. I forget, uh, it was maybe March. I'll have to look back and see. And uh, even laying in the sun for a couple of days, it took weeks to get this totally stretched out. Let's follow this pin stock down the creek and I'll talk to you about the difficulties I had with the couplings and what finally worked in the end. Sometimes I'm asked the question, am I consuming all the water in the creek? And the answer is no, I'm not. There is plenty of flow still in here and there are actually several springs right over here that um, continue to run on down the mountain. And so there is still plenty of water flowing here in the creek. By the time it gets back down to the house, it's got at least uh, 20 or 30 gallons more water. So there's uh, about 60 gallons flowing here in the creek. 
Here's the first of the 10 couplings I had to use on this 1100 feet of pipe. This right here is what gave me the most difficulty because I was trying to use couplers that would allow full flow through the pipe and not have to have the barbs inside the pipe that reduce the flow rate. And so I went through several iterations of that, trying to find something that would work. But in the end, I wound up going with the barbs because they hold the best. In here, you can see the barb fitting. I have metal hose clamps on that to hold it in place. And then I've used some Unistrut, or later on I use fence posts, and I've put more of these metal hose clamps on there. And that uh, further prevents this pipe from being able to separate. Now, my very first attempt was with these uh, blue and black connectors, but the problem was my poly pipe is, uh, I forget if it's maybe 100 PSI, and so uh, the 160 is what I needed to use those couplings, and this pipe is not thick enough. The pipe that I tested those on was uh, the correct size at the hardware store, and then I wound up ordering the smaller size, so that didn't work. Then I got these other fittings. Uh, they were uh, metal fittings, and those didn't work at all. And then I tried Fernco, and they weren't designed for pressure either. And that's why I wound up with the old tried and true barb fitting that goes inside. One nice thing about the microhydro system is how it self-regulates. You notice I had plenty of overflow coming out of my 55 gallon barrel, but if it hasn't rained for a while and the flow rate drops down, the water will slowly start shrinking down the pipe until it reaches a point where the pressure pushing out the nozzles is uh, equalized to the pressure up the hill and the flow rate will maintain at that point. So it's still able to make power even though it doesn't have the full pin stock of water. So it's pretty cool. Now there is a point where it drops so low that it just flows out the bottom and it doesn't have enough force to uh, keep the turbine spinning. But for the most of the year, it has somewhere between 50 and 100 watts of power coming off the mountain. Now, if I were to crank open more jets, I can get up to 400 watts, but then I risk uh, losing all the water in my pin stock and uh, not making any power. This is bridge number two on my micro hydro system. With your pin stock, you want it to be sloping downhill the entire way. Otherwise, if it has a, a raised spot, an air bubble might kind of rest in that area and reduce the full flow of the pipe. And so what this bridge does is it kind of skips over the creek so that the pipe doesn't have to go down into the creek and then pop back up. Because wherever it pops back up is where there's potential for an air bubble. I built this bridge and it seems to have held up quite well for the past two years. No issues whatsoever. I just made it a uh, double channel and then zip tied the pipe so that it stays in that channel and uh, just uh, keeps the pipe at a constant slope downhill. Once again, I wanted to show that the micro hydro turbine is not using all the water in the creek. So if I show you right down here, you can see this has 10 to 15 gallons a minute flowing through. And then if I step over here to the main creek, you can see more water that's not making it into the micro hydro turbine. We've just reached the end of the 1100 feet of pin stock and we're here at the micro hydro turbine. I'll show you what this looks like and go through some of the iterations that I have been through to get to this point. And I'd also like to tell you about a couple things I'd like to change for the future. Just like with my other connectors, I have a barb fitting on the poly pipe and I've used several of these hose clamps to keep more of this unistrut on here. And that prevents this from breaking free. It then swaps over to PVC pipe and goes first to a T with a pressure gauge 
so I can see what the pressure is running. I do have a relief valve over here if I need it for anything. I've got this ball valve here, which will turn on or off the turbine to allow water flow. And then it goes into this box. Now this box has made several iterations and uh, I'll show you one of those over here. This little wooden box over here is the first attempt and it worked somewhat, but was uh, not allowing enough exit water to go back down to the creek. And so I stepped up my build game to make this all PVC version and it has done well, except I need to water seal this a little bit better on this side. You can see it's got a leak over here. One of the cool things about this box is that it has a clear base on it. So you can see the water falling down into this base and then going back down to the creek. I can open up the lid here. I don't know if you could hear that or not, but when the wind hit the turbine, it slowed things down a bit. This turbine is from Langston's Alternative Power. He built the box and geared up the motor so that it would work well with my flow rate and head pressure. It also has the PVC pipes going around and I have four different nozzle sizes that will spray water into that Pelton wheel. Currently I only have one nozzle open and that's a 3 16 and that's generating close to 100 watts. This is a three phase AC turbine that sends power on all three legs up to the house, which I'll show you the electronics here in just a bit. Now my first version of this had an issue. I had it in my wooden box and a mouse got in there and chewed one of the wires of the AC power. So you can imagine the mouse uh, met a sudden end, but it also caused the turbine to meet a sudden end. It had an electrical short that um, would cause the uh, the turbine to actually burn up. So uh, Spencer sent me a new one and this is the one that's been working now for quite some time uh, doing very well. So the moral of the story is you got to keep the mice away from your turbine wires. Now I also have solar power and it kind of takes precedent over the hydro and so whenever there are um, clouds that pass by you can actually hear the hydro turbine uh, slow down because the uh, charge controller will use the power from the turbine to feed the house instead of the sun. Um, and whenever the cloud goes away and the sun shines on the solar panels, the uh, turbine here will spin up to full. And uh, so it gets louder and louder when it's not producing as much power and then gets quiet whenever it slows down with a load on it. Now when the water leaves the turbine, it goes into this three inch PVC pipe, which is sloping downhill. And this goes over here and returns to the creek. So you can see the water right here is just flowing back on down and returning to the creek. The three phase AC wires come out of the box and go into this conduit pipe here, which then travels 250 feet to the house. To be honest, the only change I really want to make down here is to fix the leak of the water coming out of the box. I think just a bead of silicone would stop that from happening. And if I have to remove the turbine, I can just pick it up and break the seal on the silicone. The other change is just to clean up the debris that I've left down here like the old housing for the turbine. The 250 feet of 10-3 wire goes through this one inch conduit. It's buried for the most part, but then it does pass over like this little drainage ditch here and it's exposed. So uh, it may heat up a little bit inside of there, but uh, hopefully it's not too bad. The wire goes up into the house through this box right here. I actually measured where the turbine placement was gonna be based on this roll of wire. So I put the wire into the house first and then rolled it out 
and then whenever it landed is where the turbine went. In the crawl space of the house, this 10-3 wire comes up to a AC to DC rectifier. Basically, it takes the three phase and turns it into a straight DC, and that is what goes over to the electronics for going into the house. This is where the biggest changes have happened for my micro hydro system. I spent countless hours squatting down here on these two panels, installing my electronics and moving things around, trying to get the best configuration. It was a nightmare. I had to move uh, my batteries down here and uh, they were very heavy. And so I built an outdoor power shed. So number one, I could stand up and work and not have to squat down here in my crawl space. And then I also was able to place the wires where I wanted them. And uh, I kind of had an idea of how things would work based on my setup that I had down here. So let me show you a little clip of how terrible this looked. And you can see why I wanted to get this tangled mess out from under the crawl space. So you can see that I also had my solar electronics down here as well. And uh, it even further complicated the tangled mess that I had. So now that you've seen how disastrous it was, let's move on to the outdoor install so you can see how much better it looks. Now I'll still warn you, I'm not an electrician, so when you see this and you're an electrician, you'll probably still cringe, but uh, for me, it is 100 times better than it was before. This is my outdoor power shed where I moved the electronics from down in the crawl space out here. And I did this for a few reasons. Like I mentioned before, I can stand up and work. I got my wiring where I want it. But also, if for some reason there was some tragic fire, this thing is double lined in this hardy concrete siding. So hopefully any fire that were to ever break out would be contained in here, or at least uh, not have much to burn once it gets to the outside. That way it wouldn't cause any kind of a house fire, um, theoretically, if uh, this were to have uh, an issue with a fire. So that's another reason why I put all these out here. Okay, let me walk you around this place and I'll talk to you about the electronics inside. The input and output of my electronics are through these two conduit that you see down here. And those go into the back of this two by eight little power shed. And uh, it is up off the ground. Hopefully that prevents any moisture from forming inside. So far it has done well. The door here on the front is nice and big. It opens up like a garage door and that uh, lets me work in the rain if I need to. It's got a metal roof on it. And if you look here on both sides, I've installed a vent. So that's just an open hole there with some screen on it. And over here, I have a solar panel and that brings power to a fan in here, which uh, helps to pull the air out whenever it's hot. So it is uh, really cloudy today, but it is blowing a little bit of air out temperature is nice and cool. In the winter time, I'm gonna to have to block those up to keep the heat inside. I do have a basic padlock down here on the bottom just to keep uh, anybody from tinkering with this or getting uh, themselves hurt. So I open it up like this and then I'm able to use this piece of unistrut to uh, open the door into position like this right here seems to work out pretty good. Because I have both solar, hydro, and off-grid going on in this little power shed, I'm gonna take a moment to break down the components so you can see how this is put together and working. To begin, let me show you that the hydro and solar are both coming in from this conduit pipe back here. They run up into a breaker box, which I have labeled hydro right here. So this breaker on this side is where the hydro is uh, contained. So that then moves over here and feeds this Midnight Classic charge controller. And you can see currently the battery is at 100%. And the main reason for that is because the solar coming in down here is, uh, looks like we have about 630 watts or so, and the hydro is just not really needed. So once the power goes into the Midnight Classic, it then moves down to the batteries. So currently I have eight of these AGM diehard batteries 
And this is actually one of the first things I'm going to be changing here uh, next year. I'm going to move to rack batteries so that I can have a whole lot more storage space instead of these AGM. So the hydro and the solar will charge these batteries. And uh, I'm working with a 48 volt system. So currently I just have two sets of uh, 48 volt. So once the batteries have been charged by the charge controllers, you can follow the red wires up. These two right here will either turn off the solar or hydro. You can see it's got hydro right here. And then moving up to these, I can turn on or off the power to the uh, grid tie inverters. I'll talk to you about those in a moment. It also goes up here to my off-grid inverter, which is a 6,000 watt, so I can run things like the microwave or refrigerator if I need to off my batteries here. I've used it a few times, uh, but our power has been pretty consistent. What's nice about this one is that it has a remote control where I can turn it on from inside the house. Now if we follow the black wire, the negative, it goes up here to a shunt and this allows me to read what's going in and out of the batteries. So that's very handy. Um, from there, it goes up here, and then these just uh, go into the charge controllers or to the uh, inverters over here. So as far as these inverters go, they have an amp clamp that uh, goes around the main of the house. And uh, from there, it uh, reads if there's any amperage being used by the home. If there is, then it sends power into the house. Uh, we only have 29 uh, watts right here on that leg, and we've got 87 on that one. So basically, those are supplementing the house. The um, air conditioner was on a moment ago, and it was pushing a lot more power into the house. Um, so if I zoom back into the solar, you can see it's dropped down to 198 or so. All right, so that's the basics. These inverters just simply plug into the house power, as you can see right here, and just uh, supplement the house with their use. The moment that the power grid goes down, these inverters are turned off. They're excited by being plugged up to the grid. So if you're worried about uh, being shocked when the power goes out, those turn off with everything else. It's 10 o'clock at night. I just wanted to show you that the uh, hydro now has uh, input that the solar has uh, stopped working. So let me zoom in here. So I'm seeing anywhere from 88 up to 103 watts coming in currently. 105 watts on that inverter. 149 on that one. Although my wiring is far from perfect, it's much better than it was when I had it in the crawl space under the house. Well, this concludes the journey through my micro hydro system over the past two years. If you've enjoyed it, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and make sure you're subscribed for more content. So now let's go ahead and talk about what this has done for me over the past year. So I don't run it during the winter time, but uh, it's making about 1.5 to two kilowatts a day. The sun is actually reducing that significantly. I actually had it doing about 4K when the solar was turned off. Um, so you can kind of compare how that's doing. If I were to run this at 2K um, per day all year long, it would save about $100 on the power bill. So you can imagine it's gonna take quite some time to pay off the system just on the hydro alone. Now for me, it was a YouTube based thing. So I was able to pay it off a bit quicker than that. Um, but my thoughts are, I'm able to use this to supplement my power um, just during the normal day. But let's say um, I have the solar as well and the power goes out. I can then use this big inverter up here to keep my stuff cold in the refrigerator and I can run the oven or the microwave and uh, make food. So it's nice to have that backup um, if the power is to go out. If you're considering micro hydro for your place, there's one calculation you need to consider and that is the power calculation for hydro. So you have your uh, flow rate, gallons per minute, times the head pressure, that's in feet, divided by 10, and that equals your power. So let me do an example here. On my system, I have 150 feet of drop, that's head pressure, times 30 gallons per minute, that is 4,500. If I divide that by 10, 
my total system power potential is 450 watts. So if I were to have uh, 30 gallons flowing through that two inch pipe and uh, opened all my nozzles up to full, I could get up to 450 watts all the time. So you can see that it takes a lot of water or a lot of head pressure or a lot of both to make usable power through microhydro. I hope you've enjoyed this journey through my microhydro system. Whenever I get the rack batteries installed, I'll bring an update video to you so you can see how well those perform. My power bill has been about $75 a month here in the summer, and I anticipate adding those batteries will let my system uh, power the house through the night, and that should drop down hopefully even more like $65 a month or less. So having the hydro and the solar together has made a huge difference. I'm Seth with Land a House. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to learn more about Micro Hydro, I have several playlists that you can watch. And also be sure to check out the Langston Alternative Power website and give Spencer a call if you are considering Micro Hydro yourself. It's a very fun hobby and uh, can provide power if the power is out and also supplement the house as well. So thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.